over Russia and Ukraine close to a peace deal in 2022. What stopped it? The U.S. Secretary of State in a high-stakes visit met the Chinese president and foreign minister. Is this a thaw or a diversion? And India's northeastern state of Manipur has seen violence for over a month. What is happening there? Welcome to Daily Debrief. I'm your host Shriya and these are the stories for the day. Russian President Putin dropped a bombshell during a meeting with leaders of African countries when he said that a peace deal with Ukraine had been signed in 2022. However, the Ukrainians reportedly did not honour the deal. This revelation came out when the leaders of the seven African countries met him as part of a peace delegation. They had also travelled to Ukraine earlier. What do these developments indicate? We have with us NewsClick's editor-in-chief, Prabir Purkayastha. So, Prabir, uh, Putin showed this draft treaty which was supposedly ditched by Ukraine. And, uh, I mean, what do we make of this uh, treaty and where does the war today stand? What does it look like and which direction is it headed given all these circumstances? Well, two different questions altogether. Because what was shown was something that happened in 2022, shortly after what's called the special military operations that the uh, Russians were doing, which is what was they announced it at. And this was a series of meetings that had taken place earlier in Belarus. And this one was supposed to have taken place in Turkey. So both sides had met that we know. I still remember the Financial Times report on this discussions that both sides were very close to a agreed document. And in fact, out of some 15 points, according to Financial Times and what I seem to remember, that almost 13 or 14 had been agreed, only one point was still open. So, and they said it's a matter of days before the still treaty is actually uh, decided. So both sides were there discussing this, and this was happening obviously with Putin as well as Zelensky in the loop. Now, what he has shown is a draft agreement in which both sides had initialed or signed, but there were still disagreements on certain issues, but certain issues had been decided. So according to, again, uh, what has been shown and what we at that time knew from what the reports that were coming in, that essentially Ukraine would agree to being not a part of any military bloc, which was the key issue that uh, Russia had, that they should not be a part of NATO, and this should be enshrined in their constitution. That seems to have been agreed. And there are a whole lot of other issues which were uh, agreed. What was really clearly not agreed to was that both sides had differences of how much arms, uh, weapons Ukraine would keep and not keep. So there is a table on which both sides have their figures. Russia says X, the Ukraine says Y. But they, were, they did not seem to be any fundamental objection to discussing the number of weapons each side would keep, I mean, which side the Ukraine would keep and that it would there would be a limit. So it seems both sides were close to an agreement. And this is what was surprising. Suddenly, how this whole thing turned, and it seems to have turned not between the negotiators, but seems to have turned when Boris Johnson went to Ukraine, met with Zelensky, and it seems to be that was the point at which Zelensky withdrew from the treaty. Ukraine withdrew from the treaty. Now, what changed? That's, that is the big question. Why is it, or what were the assurances Boris Johnson had given Zelensky, making it possible, or making the that being the reason why Zelensky seems to have uh, withdrawn from the treaty. So the conventional wisdom has been that there were threats, that if you don't do this, we won't give you any money, you will be completely at the mercy of the Russians, we won't support you, and the implicit threat, therefore, you could also be deposed, you have enough uh, for you know people inside uh, Ukraine to see that you are uh, pulled down. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So this is the conventional wisdom which some of us had. Uh, now there is another part of the story, which is uh, has been put forward by some of the military analysts that the price that was offered to Zelensky 
or that will give you advanced weapons, will give them very quickly. And with advanced weapons and completely, uh, what shall we say, in integration of those weapons with our satellite system, our signaling system will be such that you will be able to punch through the Russian lines and therefore you will be able to at least push them back if not defeat them. So this was the basis, it seemed, that uh, this treaty was re re sabotaged by uh, Ukraine, I mean by Boris Johnson and uh, both the UK and the United States playing the key role. Of course, the other part of it is as a goodwill gesture, Russia had withdrawn their soldiers away from Kyiv. Now, the argument is that this was a defeat for Russia. Russians have said this was a goodwill gesture because we are almost close to an agreement. So again, we will never know till the archives are, archives are open 25 years down the line what things really are. But both these possibilities are open and depending on what you want to believe, well, these are the two positions. Uh, right, Prabir. And something can also be said about this uh, first-of-a-kind initiative that African leaders are taking uh, in the form of the peace delegation. Do you think it stands a chance, uh, given that the uh, counter-offensive as its backdrop, there's new fighting that's resumed? What can we make of it? Well, you know, the chance of a peace initiative at the moment still doesn't appear bright. Uh, there is still the hope that the NATO powers, as well as Ukraine seems to have, that they might be able to achieve a breakthrough on the ground in their counteroffensive. And if they do, then strategically things will improve for them. Now, if they really did manage to make a break a breakthrough and cut off the land corridor between Crimea and uh, Russia, then yes, they would certainly improve their strategic position considerably. That on the, what we are seeing right now is not on the cards. In fact, what we are seeing is that Russia, Russia has managed to work out uh, their tactics in a way that whatever Ukraine is using, its advanced tanks, Bradleys, Abrams, all of that is not really creating much of a damage to the Russian lines. And it doesn't seem that in any of the places that uh, Ukraine offensive has been able to reach even the first real defense that Russia has on the ground, which are really something which are difficult or costly for the other side to cross. What's called the dragon teeth, trenches, barbed wire, a lot of uh, other paraphernalia. And this generally are about 20 to 30 miles or kilometers behind the front line or whatever is the really the front the line of separation at the moment so looking at the picture again things can change it's not that ukraine has put all its forces uh, to achieve a breach but at the moment it doesn't look like there is any progress they have been able to make in a significant sense we're not talking of tens five kilometers you know getting inside uh, russia Russian held territory. That's those things happen which are really not significant strategically. It doesn't seem that the they have really made any significant advances that we can see. Given this, is there a chance for peace? Well, it will not depend on Ukraine. It really depends what NATO is going to decide, and particularly the United States. And we have to wait for the NATO summit. I think that that is taking place in July 11th or something like that. So when the NATO summit takes place in July, at that time, they'll have to take stock. Thank you once again for joining us today, Prabir. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to China sparked interest around the globe as the two powers attempted a move towards improving their tense relationship. During his visit, the first since 2018, Blinken met President Xi Jinping. Is Washington aiming to mend relations with Beijing while joining hands with Japan and allies or is there more to this attempted thaw? We ask Anish. 
Welcome back to the show, Anish. So, this is being hailed as a very important uh, visit from a US official to China and it comes at an important time because it is an attempt to thaw the tensed relations which we have seen in recent months. Could you elaborate on the significance on this trip and how it's likely to shape uh, the politics in the region and the politics between these two countries? Yeah, so uh, the uh, the kind of agreements that they have uh, come across or any kind of uh, agreement on uh, a future plan is yet to be clear. But what we see is that both sides are showing that there has been a positive candid talk. That's what, they, that's what both the statements are actually saying. Uh, and it shows that there is definitely and very likely some positive results coming out of uh, this meeting, uh, it is quite significant because this is the first time that uh, a U.S. Uh, State Secretary is uh, visiting China in I think, over five years now. And uh, it comes at a time, as you said, uh, when like tensions are quite high in the region. Uh, China has very clearly uh, s- stated its position on Taiwan and it is non-negotiable. The fact that it, they're Stating it outright uh, in this conversation with uh, Blinken shows that China is not ready to compromise on that matter, uh, whatever the U.S. side's pressure will be. Uh, But on the other hand, the U.S. has downplayed that part of the whole thing because uh, obviously you you can't move forward from there if you're going to keep insisting on China, uh, sorry, on Taiwan and like whatever your conception of Taiwan would be. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the focus was definitely on uh, what they say, keeping communi- lines of communication open, uh, which means that they want the trade to continue. They want uh, movement of people, goods, services, all of that to keep going. Uh, they want academic uh, collaboration to continue. All of that cannot be like there is, uh, it clearly shows that despite what we have seen in recent months where the U.S., has actually tried to uh, force some of the some of its allies, especially in Europe, uh, to try to decouple from China. Uh, this is kind of like a U-turn in many ways because they're trying to backtrack on the fact that uh, on their insistence on trying to decouple and you know br- bring down uh, any kind of uh, association with China uh, by either trying to change chip production, like that is one part of this or trying to move other kinds of uh, you know supply lines away from china which is not happening because you cannot overlook uh, a massive economic powerhouse that china has become right now and uh, and not just an economic powerhouse it's a major uh, production uh, factory of the world at this point in time and so even all this attempts to uh, you know bypass china is basically just creating more, uh, you know, middlemen in the form of Southeast Asia or East Asia who are essentially, you know, using Chinese products and, you know, uh, you know, manufacturing them in a different way in their site. So basically it just creates, expands the volume that Chinese trade uh, and diversifies its uh, trading partners as well. So you would really just, there is no, uh, you know, workable solution where you can actually isolate China economically. Pretty much most of the world requires China just as much as China requires the rest of the world. So this uh, notion, this uh, talk about keeping uh, lines of communication open clearly indicates that the U.S. is not really uh, that serious about trying to isolate China at this point in time or probably it understands the fact that it cannot do that and obviously is not pursuing it. Uh, and actually wants to keep, uh, you know, healthy relations open. So in many ways, like what we've seen from the statements, uh, and at least at the Chinese side, we've seen uh, they're actually insisting that there be stable and predictable relations. Uh, and the insistence of predictable is uh, like, uh, we have to emphasize that fact as well, considering how unpredictable U.S. Uh, foreign policy has been over the past several years. Obviously, U.S. keeps talking about the rule of law and, you know, trying to maintain everything within the status. But definitely, they have insisted on maintaining status quo on several aspects of continued uh, flow of trade, uh, culture, and, uh, you know, scientific and research collaborations that is happening between the two countries. So there are definitely those aspects of it. Nevertheless, you see, like, Western commentators being very hawkish at the moment. but Obviously, that is not what 
necessarily guides uh, U.S. foreign policy all the time. And at this point in time, we're seeing some positive development. Uh, if this is going to have reciprocal uh, visit from Chinese side, uh, maybe Chindang uh, visiting the U.S. in some future, we do not know. We also do not know if there are any kind of framework, frameworks, a common framework or agreement that they are trying to uh, work around. At this point, we just know that like negotiations are back on track. Thanks for that, Anish. We'll be back with you soon for another update from the region. For over a month, India's northeast state of Manipur has witnessed ethnic violence that has killed at least 100 people and over 4,000 cases of arson. Since May 2023, there have been many instances of mob violence and hate speech. Opposition parties have criticised the BJP, which is in power both in the centre and the state, for not doing enough to deal with the issue. Siddhant Annie, who is in Manipur as we speak, gave a ground report. Siddhant, thank you for joining us despite poor internet connectivity. Uh, can you give us a recap of what all has happened in the past one month and what are the latest updates? So, I don't know if you can tell from uh, the backdrop, but we are uh, currently in Imphal, the capital of the state of Manipur, where uh, violence uh, broke out on the 3rd of May. Uh, it has continued ever since. Uh, the, the conflict is uh, at this point between uh, two communities, the Mete community, which is the dominant community, approximately 53% of the population of the state of Manipur. Uh, and the other side, uh, the Kuki, which are a tribe uh, connected to the Mizo uh, Kuki Chin group. They're approximately 10% of the state's population. Uh, what we have found uh, in the course of reporting from here, or at least uh, trying to uh, sort of ascertain certain facts uh, from the time that we've been here, about two weeks, uh, is that uh, police sources have confirmed to us over 130 people have officially been killed. Of course, senior sources in the police who asked not to be named uh, have also said that these figures should be looked at with some amount of caution uh, because the extent of the damage and, and you know, uh, the, the extent of the reporting also of people who are either missing or dead uh, cannot be fully determined at this point uh, because tens of thousands of people have also been displaced as of the latest figures that we had close to 40,000 people, uh, internally displaced people, most of whom uh, belong to the Kuki community, are still living in uh, makeshift relief camps that have been set up in schools, colleges, and other such uh, areas, wherever essentially place could be found. Uh, most of these are also being run by volunteers, local politicians, and on donations from their respective communities. Uh, on the social front, there's been a complete, or there is a complete uh, divide at this point. Uh, both the Mete and the Kuki are uh, physically separated now. The Imphal Valley, which is sort of a center circle uh, in the broader geography of the state of Manipur, which is a hill state in India, in India's northeast, uh, they occupy predominantly, uh, at this point, uh, the peripheries of the valley. Uh, the Kuki have been pushed up from the foothills to the higher hills uh, of Manipur. Uh, and are currently, many of them are still uh, sort of hiding out uh, in the jungle. Uh, the, the, the conflict is also, I uh, apologize for, for the sort of uh, breaks in this conversation, but uh, the, the conflict also has taken on all kinds of uh, different political dynamics and essentially uh, the unfortunate reality of it is that both sides are uh, to this point not being able to engage in any sort of constructive dialogue. Uh, at the centre of all of this is uh, Chief Minister N. Biren Singh, who of course belongs to the Bharatiya Janata Party, the same party uh, that is in power in the state, with an overwhelming majority as far as the Legislative Assembly here is concerned, and also in the centre, of course, uh, where Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister and is uh, heading to the United States for a state visit. Uh, the Prime Minister has been completely silent so far on the situation in Manipur. Uh, what is, I think, extremely shocking is that uh, unlike any sort of uh, ethnic or inter-community uh, conflict we have uh, really seen or that comes to mind uh, here in India at least, the entire state is embroiled, involved uh, and sort of uh, has been taken over by, uh, by, by what is going on. Uh, there is still uh, an atmosphere of uh, complete fear. Uh, so, uh, you know, you see at night uh, women of every locality out on the streets uh, patrolling to try and ensure that their neighborhoods, 
their homes uh, are not threatened in any way. Uh, but a lot of it is, uh, this is not because uh, the violence is breaking out so frequently. It's more because of uh, the sort of narrative of fear that has been created on either side, uh, unfortunately, by the leadership and the leadership's uh, on both sides, leadership's inability to sort of actually sit down and talk. Even when the union home minister uh, visited, Amit Shah visited, uh, he went and met both sides, but he met them separately instead of bringing everyone to a common table to sort of maybe try and initiate dialogue. So I think uh, by and large, whether you talk to Kuki people or you talk to Mete people, uh, the sense of frustration is massive. Uh, th there is a sort of... The, anger against the political elite, which is very well entrenched and well established uh, here in Manipur. And, and that anger is finding its way out uh, now because uh, mobs have uh, sort of been allowed one way or the other to uh, run amok uh, to sort of with, with impunity uh, and to destroy uh, homes, uh, including the homes of elected officials, government properties, uh, cars, etc., etc. Just a few days ago, in fact, uh, the Minister of State uh, at the, in the central government, that is, uh, a junior minister for foreign affairs, R.K. Ranjan Singh, his personal home was uh, set completely on fire and destroyed uh, by, again, uh, a faceless mob. Uh, the interesting part of that story is that in response to it, uh, the, the local police made 17 arrests. Uh, the figures that we have so far is that there have been over 4,500 instances of arson that have taken place since the 3rd of May. After, as a result of all of these killings, all of the arson that has taken place, only a total of 39 arrests were made uh, prior to the burning down of the home of the minister. But since then, I, uh, the, we see a slight change in the attitude of uh, the central police forces, such as the Rapid Action Force, which is essentially a, a riot control police uh, that, that has been deployed here in quite large numbers. I think the orders to them have been changed. Uh, unofficially, sources have indicated that to us. They are now taking more proactive steps to, uh, to, to control these mobs and make sure that not uh, too much more damage is done. But the fact of the matter is that at least in Imphal, which is the largest city by far in the state of Manipur, uh, now lines have been drawn along these uh, tribal or ethnic lines. Uh, Tuki have been completely uh, driven out of the city and similarly, uh, Maiti populations who live in different parts, uh, in different population centers, such as Turachanpur in the hills, uh, which is considered a, a part of the hills, uh, they have also moved out, uh, fearing for their own safety. Uh, people are hoping to, of course, go back home uh, to resettle, rebuild, uh, and to continue living with the communities that they've uh, sort of born, been born in uh, and lived together with uh, for so many years. But for that to happen, there needs to be some political uh, action first, some political conversations need to be had first and assurances of safety need to be given. Uh, and at this point, trust levels are at an all-time low uh, in the Enbiran Singh government and, and uh, also uh, the state as well as the central forces that have been deployed. Siddhant, so the internet ban has been going on for as long as the violence started. Can you tell us a little bit about what has been the economic impact been on those communities that are marginalized, that have been shifted up the hills, that are already inhabiting these spaces, uh, I mean beyond the Imphal Valley? So, uh, of course, as you can see from perhaps scenes uh, in the background, uh, in Imphal and other districts, uh, curfew has been relaxed to an extent now, so uh, things are allowed to open and function till about 5 p.m. Uh, so for about 12 hours in the day from 5 a.m. to p uh, 5 p.m., people are uh, allowed to go about their business. Uh, so shops, etc., are opening and trying to find at least uh, some kind of business. People and today is uh, it's a Monday, uh, Monday afternoon, and so people are obviously out in large numbers trying to get various kinds of things done. It's extremely difficult. We we are in the the 21st century. Uh, and uh, there has been a massive push, like there has been in the rest of the country, towards digitization. So a lot of things were happening uh, on the internet. The internet has been completely shut down, uh, barring certain uh, official uh, sort of uh, home ministry allowed uh, places where the internet is still functioning. But that means, by and large, most of the population does not have access to the internet at all. Uh, businesses have been shut down. Businesses that are run by other communities, not either Mete nor Kuki, have also been shut down because of uh, 
fear, uh, the atmosphere of uh, sort of really fear that, that uh, pervades everything and not knowing essentially what happens next. Uh, so not just are people being hit uh, quite hard by the economic factors that this violence has resulted in, uh, but also they, they, while they are in their homes, uh, they also, there's anxiety, there's uh, restlessness, uh, and, and there's uncertainty because really no, no solution or uh, nothing, no change seems to be uh, in sight, unfortunately. Students are suffering. It is the time for uh, exams at a national level. So uh, things are, of course, much get much, much harder as you move further outside this inner circle of Imphal. Uh, as it is, the people living on the periphery are largely agrarian uh, agriculturists. Uh, so for them to even, so the paddy crop, for example, uh, this is the planting season. That will suffer really hard, which will have, we'll see the consequences of which perhaps uh, next year when it's time to uh, sort of sell that paddy crop uh, in the market. But uh, the impact can't be sort of restricted to any one sector or any one kind of people, uh, except for perhaps the, the same political elite, many of whom have, of course, even left the state and are going about their business in places like Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Guwahati, etc. Uh, but the poorest have, of course, as in, in any conflict, uh, be, A, been involved the most directly because it's their homes uh, that are being attacked uh, the most, they're being burned down the most. And of course, uh, they continue to live uh, very close uh, to each other. And, and the conflict also continues largely between uh, those areas. So those who are, uh, are uh, dependent on uh, daily labor to earn a living and a livelihood have been hit the hardest and are finding it extremely difficult. And that's why many of them also continue to remain in these relief camps because they really have no option about where else to go. And that's all we have for today. For most stories, keep watching peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube.